Hey everybody, I just wanted to pop in here and say thank you so much for your support of the FUMS podcast show. I don't take your time and attention for granted. I am so grateful that you choose to spend time here with me. I specifically wanted to thank Guitars by Grant for his stellar review of the pod. His review said this, quote, Kathy so willingly shares her knowledge and passion for all things MS. She's constantly asking questions and then shares what she knows. It's all about community, and Kathy does it best. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing and caring. You rock, unquote. No, you rock guitars by Grant. I really appreciate it. These ratings and reviews help get the word out about the FUMS podcast show. If you get value from this podcast, I'd so appreciate it if you'd share it with others who could benefit and leave me a rating and review. Just go to FUMSnow.com forward slash review And it'll walk you through the seriously one-minute process to leave a rating and review in iTunes. Thanks in advance. Oh, and one more quick shout-out before we start the show. I don't think my husband or my kids have ever even listened to one of my podcast episodes, but one of my friend's husbands listens to every single episode. Isn't that amazing? So shout-out to you, Jimmy Mears. I really appreciate it, Jimmy. Thanks so much for the support. Welcome to the FUMS Now podcast show, where you'll gain information, inspiration, and motivation for living your best life with multiple sclerosis. Find us online at FUMSnow.com. I'm your host, Kathy Reagan Young. Today's guest is Linda Elsgood, a woman from the UK that was diagnosed with MS in 2000, and it got so bad she considered ending her own life. She stumbled upon a little, inexpensive pill with very low side effect profile that made all the difference in the world for her. Since then, she's dedicated herself to spreading the word about the little pill that could. Linda has been taking low-dose naltrexone with great success over the last 15 years. She founded the LDN Research Trust in 2004. She runs the trust, raising awareness of LDN, answering questions from users and the medical profession, and helping people around the world find an LDN prescribing doctor. She's interviewed over 800 prescribing doctors so far and shares her list on the LDNResearchTrust.org site. She obviously knows what she's talking about. So let's go meet Linda. Hey, Linda. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Thank you for inviting me, Kathy. Absolutely. You have quite an MS diagnosis story. You lived, and I'm putting that in air quotes, you lived with MS uh, for several years before you found LDN. It's quite a story. Share your MS diagnosis story with us, if you would, please. Okay. I had been a very sickly child. I had Epstein-Barr virus when I was 13, Mm. and I think that was the start of my MS. I had more or less a year off school. Uh, I was very fatigued. Um, At that time, I was five foot five. My mother was only four foot nine, and I can remember her having to carry me to the car. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was very difficult. Um, I was just so, so tired, and I think that must have been like chronic fatigue syndrome or or something. Mm, Yeah. Anyway, I I got over that, um, had lots more problems, which looking back, probably were autoimmune. Um, I had trouble with my menstrual cycle. I had um, DNCs starting when I was 17. Gracious. Um, I think I've had about probably 13 different operations now um, with polyps and fibroids and mm. medical cancer and goodness knows what else. Gracious. <clears throat> But I would have odd things happen to me. Um, My leg would go numb or my legs would feel very shaky. But these, uh, and numbness, tingling, pins and needles, but things never stayed for long. They used to come and I would think, hmm, this is odd. I Mm -hmm. don't like that. (laughs) I'll have to tell somebody if it doesn't go and then it would go. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, everything was a standalone problem, mm-hmm. and that problem had been resolved. I mean, I, I didn't really know anything about autoimmune diseases. I didn't know anything about MS, mm-hmm. apart from one lady who lived up the road. Uh, she'd had MS for five years when we moved here, and she had one stick. 
then she had two, then she had crutches, then mm -hmm. she had a um, electric scooter, and then sadly she died. <clears throat> so I was thinking, mm. but I was diagnosed. I, I certainly <laughs> didn't want yes. to. Um, so it was really scary, and I'd had problems with my bladder um, since I was 17 as well, getting UTIs regularly. Mm. And eventually I was um, sent to the hospital, saw a urologist, they put a camera in my bladder and told me that some women have this problem and it was normal for me, nothing mm. to worry about. So when they were trying to diagnose me with MS, they asked, how's your bladder? And I said, oh, my, <laughs> my bladder's normal. Mm. And they looked it up and said, but you're getting all these UTIs. How can you possibly think that that's normal? <laughs> I said, because I was told it was normal, feeling right. really stupid. Mm. Um, but I can remember pre-being diagnosed, going out with a cycle ride with my husband and holding the handlebars. And after holding the handlebars for a while, in between my forefinger and my thumb, you know that piece of mm -hmm. fleshy skin and yes. muscle you've got there, it would cramp. <laughs> and I can remember saying to him, when you hold your handlebar do you find that you get cramp mm -hmm. you know, you're just weird you know and <laughs> why do all these funny things keep happening to me you know I, I didn't mm -hmm. know but uh, I wasn't doing too badly um I was looking after my children my husband when he worked he was um always had to work away from home so mm -hmm. when he was on off days he obviously was at home but when he was at work he was away so I was being the mum's taxi taking the children here and there mm -hmm. working full-time seeing to the house and the shopping and I really felt I was Wonder Woman you know <laughs> give it to me and right. I can do it right <laughs> I can get it done <clears throat> and um it was before Christmas 2000 uh, 1999 and I'd, it had been snowing and very, very cold and icy. And my friend was coming around to cut my hair. And I came in and all I wanted to do was have a cup of coffee. It had taken mm -hmm. me, instead of taking 20 minutes to get home, it had taken like an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and in rush hour traffic, all the traffic had come to a standstill because we're not used to lots of snow here. Mm -hmm. So I was taking my coat off. My friend was saying, hurry up, come on, let me get start cutting your hair. The phone rang as I was taking my coat off, and it was my father. Now, he never used the phone. He's very hard of hearing mm. and hated it to tell me that my mum had had a heart attack. Oh, no. And he was disabled. He was in a wheelchair, and he was telling me the ambulance wouldn't take him with my mum, and he didn't want to leave her because he was a liability because there was nobody to look after him. Mm. So I, said, oh, I was an hour and a half away, and I said, well, go with them in the ambulance and tell them I'm on my way and mm. I'll, I'll see to you. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Um, mother was seriously ill. Um, it was very touch and go. And I sat with her all night, which was really silly, but I thought if I went to sleep, she would die and that would be that. So I had to mm. keep awake so she didn't, <laughs> didn't die. Mm. <clears throat> and after that, I, mean, I was very close to my mum. It's as though that was a trigger to kicking everything off big time. Hmm. And oh, that stress. Yeah, everything mm -hmm. went wrong with me. And I had to go back to work. Um, luckily, a friend of ours, his wife was a nurse, and she came and looked after both mum and dad while I went to work. And I was so tired. I was, it was like wading through mud. I could manage once my mum and dad had gone home and my friends had gone <clears throat> and we'd established a new norm. Mm -hmm. I would drive to work, do everything I needed to do for work, drive home and just crash out. I couldn't mm -hmm. do anything. And I said to my husband, you know, I don't feel I can work full time anymore. I just, I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So instead of working five days a week, I worked four made absolutely no difference it was just mm -mm. too much yeah so I thought well okay it was coming up to Easter how about if we go away on holiday this is how naive I was <laughs> if we go away on holiday and leave all the illness and things here go away have a nice time and come back and I'll be how I used to be <laughs> if only 
If only, yeah, exactly. My husband said, well, I can't have time off work and my eldest daughter had left home. So it was just me and my youngest daughter. So we went to Portugal and it was meant to be very warm and it was very cold and we'd only packed summer clothes. Um, and it was raining and they had drained the heating in the apartment that we were in. So there was no heating so when you went out and got wet you couldn't dry your clothes but I can remember the the rain and the wind hitting my face and my face was numb with pins and needles mm. of course it was the rain <clears throat> right so I said to my husband and I said well I think I might have to go and see the doctor when I get back anyway went to saw my doctor and waited and waited and waited and it wasn't until the August that I saw wow Bolton who gave me 28 different blood tests. I had evoked potential tests. I had a lumbar puncture, an MRI. And the nurse said to me she'd come to do something or other. <clears throat> They'd ad admitted me and said, how long have you had MS? So oh, I said, oh, I haven't got MS. Oh, 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 um, mm, I must have mm. the wrong patient. Very sorry. Mm. And then. Ten minutes later, the doctor came to tell me I had MS. So she did know, <laughs> she did know and she shouldn't have told me. But anyway, right. um, I had a course of uh, intravenous steroids and my situation was so dire, I was going downhill so quickly that in six weeks' time, the neurologist wanted to do a second MRI and he gave me another course of steroids. I'd lost the hearing in my left ear. I had double vision. I <clears throat> couldn't think, couldn't speak, hear, and I slept. I just slept all day, mm -hmm. um, all day, every day. I could just wake up to go to the toilet um, and have something to eat and drink. Couldn't talk to me because listening was too tiring, talking was too tiring. Mm. I mean, wow. it's, um, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of fun to revisit, I'm sure. No. So that was that uh, in 2000 that you were diagnosed? Is that what you said? That's right. I was okay. diagnosed in 2000. And then in 2003, I believe you said that your neurologist said that you had now progressed to secondary progressive. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That was That's right. Pretty quick. Yeah. Um, a typical day, how I felt, the left-hand side of my body, and I mean the left-hand side, you could have drawn a pencil down mm. my forehead, my mm. nose, my chin, my chest, was completely numb with pins and needles. You know, if I went to the toilet and wiped my bottom, I could feel one side and I couldn't feel the other. Wow. Uh, it was just the whole of my body. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I'd lost the hearing in my left ear. I had very bad double vision. I'd started to choke on food. Uh, my husband uh, used to help me by hitting me on the back, but he didn't, <laughs> didn't really do a lot. Yeah. Um, and trip over nothing, mm -hmm. fall over nothing, stumble over nothing. I had no balance at all. I had very bad vertigo. Um, trying to recall vocabulary was very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would get things wrong. I have never been a tea drinker. And I'd say to my husband, can you make me a cup of tea? And he'd say, well, don't you mean a cup of coffee? Well, I said a cup of coffee. No, you said a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. But it was all of these things. Mm -hmm. And he thought that by correcting me next time I'd know. But it didn't, didn't work. <laughs> yeah. It didn't, didn't work, work like that. that. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I would try so hard if people came to visit and I would get up and try and listen to the conversation. And I'd fall asleep. Mm. I would try and join in and put a sensible uh, sentence together. And that's how bad it was. I would try to put a sentence together. But by which time I found what I thought would sound okay and say it, the conversation had moved on. So it sounded mm. really random. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be muddled anyway. So it was very difficult for people to understand me. I had very bad pains in my head. Very, very, very bad pains. Um, and I think that was a really difficult thing. I haven't ever got to the bottom of it, but sometimes it was the size of a 
a standard wine glass, that was the area that the pain was. But sometimes it would be the front left, the back right, it would move. Mm-hmm. And I think people Strange. must look at me thinking, hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was true, you know. Right. And, and when I was being asked about pain, apart from the pain in the head, which I call pain, the pins and needles were so bad. Mm. And I just called it pins and needles. Mm-hmm. And then it, eventually somebody said, but isn't that pain when it hurts? And it was just like, right. yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> It's all relative. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, and when your doctor told you in 2003 that you had progressed to secondary progressive MS, um, he also told you, told you that there was really nothing more they could do for you. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Wow. And I, as I was saying, my, my daughter was away at school. Um, my husband was away at work. And I had run out of my painkillers and the doctor had come out to see me and he brought the painkillers. He got me a glass of water. And I remember saying to him, you know, do you think I'm going to feel any better? And he said, well, I think if you were going to, you would have done by now. Mm. And I had these very strong painkillers. And it, it was a trade-off because the painkillers took the edge off, so that it mm. made it bearable. But what came with it was nausea. Mm. I felt so nauseous, I could hardly move. It was like being oh, gosh. pregnant and travel sick and everything at once. You know, you mm-hmm. dared hardly move. And then I used to wish I hadn't taken them because that made me feel so ill. But the doctor left and I looked at the tablets and thought, you know, it's really hard for me lying in bed I felt as though I was looking at one of those calendars that flick over it's Mm -hmm. watching the days of the week go one two three what have I done Mm -hmm. I've just laid here all I could hope to do was um not wet myself which happened um Mm -hmm. I was having I, I couldn't really brush my hair or or shower that was the goal was to get showered, washed, mm. dressed, back in bed, eat, and then mm. it was the next day. That was well, that was all I did. And it, what really hurt was the, the look in people's eyes, especially on parents who would say, oh, I wish we could take it off you, I wish it was us and, and not you. Mm. The despair and the, I would say pity, but they felt sorry for me and everybody's mm. life was on hold because – I was taking over everybody's life. Mm. And I really thought at that time that, you know, if I was just to end it, people would understand why mm. and that they would <clears throat> be able to carry on with their own life. I do apologise. I do have a <laughs> cold. That's okay. I'm trying to uh, no worries. get over. No worries. Um, but the, the reason why I didn't take the pills was it would be my 15-year-old daughter that would find me and there was mm. no way I could do that to her Mm -hmm. so the only thing I could do was to prove everybody wrong and that Mm -hmm. I could improve yeah that's amazing I I'm very glad by the way that you had the presence of mind to consider your daughter at that time um because that's what kept you alive so does she know that she's the reason you didn't do that yes yes I was gonna say if she didn't before you don't want her to listen to this then, but yeah. <laughs> yes, she does. And she was really very good. The whole of the school summer holiday, she didn't really go out, do anything. She she bathed me, washed me, brushed my hair, washed my hair. At one point, I was finding it difficult to find my mouth. So she was feeding me and giving me oh drinks. Gosh. Dealing with At 15. things. Wow. Yeah, that, that came in. But she's now a nurse, so <laughs> that's the best outcome. Yes, yes. Yeah, that geez. empathy that our children find because of what they go through with us, yeah. right? But she also, um, previously, when she was eight, persuaded us to adopt two cats, two Burmese <laughs> cats, and she—they were three—and she'd wanted kittens. And I think she paid some sort of trump card 
of saying, oh, there's these two kittens that, you know, are for sale. Can we have them? And mm-hmm. anyway, my husband gave in. So mm-hmm. we had four cats at one time. <laughs> at wow. one time. So her reward for looking after me that summer was to have a pair of kittens. Oh, (laughs) that was a good reward. (laughs) So after that, after you decided against actually taking all those bills, Mm -hmm. thankfully, gratefully for all of our sakes, um, you said that you just sort of sat on the computer. You assume there must be other people out there in the same same boat as you. And mm-hmm. in fact, there were. You stumbled upon information on, on low-dose naltraxone or LDN and a whole like online community of people who were on this drug and experiencing great success, right? Well, a whole online community probably is about 10 people oh. <laughs> at that time. Well, um, that was 10 more than you knew about, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could only manage to sit for, for 10 minutes at a time because to actually get to the computer was very problematic. Um, mm. Spend a lot of time on the floor. Um, and to look at a screen with one eye, because I could only look through one eye at a time, was difficult so after 10 minutes I was just so worn out and tired I just had to sleep mm. a nap could be three hours it was that bad but I did manage to find people who were saying that they were taking low dose naltrexone and how well it had worked for them and it wasn't harmful you know if it didn't yeah. do any good it wasn't going to do you any harm well at that point I didn't really feel I had a lot to lose right if, if even if there had been side effects I would have still I uh, tried it. it. Sure. Makes so sense. I got all the information. I took it to my GP, um, medical doctor, mm-hmm. who had retired, my old doctor, and I had a new one. And she looked about the same age as my daughter. She was oh, very young. gosh. And she wasn't a partner in the practice. And I asked her if she would read the information and would she be able to prescribe it. So she got me to come back in two weeks' time. And she said she'd read everything and she'd spoken to the partners and they said, no, she couldn't prescribe it. Mm. However, if it was her, she said she would want to try it. So if I could get a prescription, she would monitor me. Mm. So I thought that was a really good compromise. Mm -hmm. And There was a doctor in Wales, Dr. Bob Lawrence, who prescribed the LDN for me. And wow, it was absolutely amazing. So did you see... Uh, an immediate improvement or how long did it take before you saw improvement? Well, I had been warned that possibly I might have initial side effects Mm -hmm. and I had nothing. Mm, And I was, I was devastated. I wanted headaches. I wanted (laughs) an upset stomach or... Sure, to know it's working, right? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I could have been taking, you know, paracetamol. It it did absolutely nothing. And then after three weeks, Oh, it was amazing because living in my head, I always say it was like a television set that wasn't tuned in, couldn't see properly, think properly, you know, didn't mm-hmm. function. Mm-hmm. And if you can imagine a muddy puddle and just dropping some bleach in it and mm-hmm. it just suddenly clearing, uh-huh. that was what my mm-hmm. head was like. I could suddenly begin to see mm-hmm. and hear and think and process things have a conversation. Uh, my husband still thinks I talk a lot of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, it those husbands. <laughs> amazing. Totally, wow. totally amazing. It, it didn't happen all overnight. I mean, <clears throat> I had about a um, year just over in bed, mm. then another like 18 months in a wheelchair. And when people say they've not, walked for that length of time and suddenly can get up and walk I don't know how that can happen because my tendons shrunk sure and I had to see a podiatrist just once I started walking the pain in the arch of my foot was unbearable Mm. it was absolutely unbearable but with exercise and not giving in um you know you can build yourself back up. Mm-hmm. And when I had um, one of the evoke potential tests on my eyes, there was a checkered board, if, if I remember rightly, <clears throat> and it showed how much nerve damage I'd had. 
And my hearing in my left ear, it was completely blank. It just showed a straight line. It showed mm. nothing. And the lady that um, did the test said to me that the brain has so many redundant nerves, the brain can rewire itself. You know, not to worry. You know, it doesn't look good now, but it could rewire itself. Mm. And sure enough, you know, over time, my hearing has never been a hundred percent ever mm -hmm. anyway but it's pretty it's good out. i, I can hear with my left ear the only time uh, i find a problem is if i'm in a very crowded noisy room um, mm -hmm. and i can't see people's lips because when i was younger i was I was deaf and I think I must have learned to lip read. Mm -hmm. People, I can hear them a lot better if I can see them, if I can see the lips. <laughs> that's so funny. perhaps I still do that. <laughs> I completely understand that though. It's like when I, my daughter just noticed this about me. When I don't know where I'm going, where I'm driving, I can't even have the radio on. She's mm -hmm. like, how, how is it that you see better if you have it quiet? <laughs> I don't know, but I do. I've got to have it quiet. It's just too much going on all at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, um. Definitely. So the, was the first thing that you noticed then, like your, your sight cleared up or what was the very first thing you noticed? It was more or less simultaneously the sight and the hearing and the thought process. They um, were the, it was the cognitive nice. uh, things that I, I noticed. Yeah. And then slowly, you know, the balance improved and the, the bowel and bladder started to improve and the choking and the slurring and... <clears throat> wow. It was like, I don't know, having a tower of bricks knocking them over and slowly they're reversing the fall down of it building back up again. You've yeah. seen those pictures, haven't you? you know? Right, yes. Or you're being yeah. built back up again. Right. Um, and that is how I feel, you know, that's what happened to me. And so how long until you really felt like yourself again? It was about 18 months. So starting around the three week point and then continual yeah. maybe incremental improvement till about 18 months and then you felt real but it didn't solid. happen without effort okay. i had to put a lot of effort into improving and like everybody else when mm -hmm. you feel you're having a good day when you haven't had a good day for so long mm -hmm. <clears throat> i could remember the bedroom that I'd been in was what they called apple white. It was a white but with a shimmer of green mm. in it. Mm -hmm. And I'd spent so long looking at these walls, I just couldn't bear it any mm. longer. And I felt quite good. And I thought to myself, I have some white paint. <clears throat> <laughs> I have some masking tape. So gradually I put masking tape around everything. And my parents were coming over, and I was painting this. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's all fitted wardrobes and dressing tables. So there wasn't a lot of wall. Mm -hmm. So I was painting this wall, and I can remember my mum coming, and I had this gap in the middle that I couldn't do, and my legs were going. Mm. I used to bob up and down as though my legs were like rubber bands. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do it. I just had to sit on the floor. And she said, what's the matter? I said, I just, I can't do it. I can't, <laughs> I mm. can't stand up to finish it. Um, but I then paid for it because mm. I had overdone it. Oh, yeah. I think I had like three days where I couldn't move at all. Oh, gosh, but it's, yeah. But it's, it's pushing the envelope. It's expanding on what you can do mm -hmm. slowly, gradually. But I think most people, when you haven't been able to do things, and suddenly you can, it's very easy to overdo it. Oh, not absolutely. Yeah. So, I, you know, listening to your body is crucial, but mm -hmm. initially it's very hard to do. It's easier to say. Than to right. Do. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. As with most things. Um, so was it at that point after about the 18 months um, that you started sort of your crusade to let others know about the LDN? Before. I started LDN. I had been assessed by the company doctor who um, I was a, I worked in telephone banking 
Mm-hmm. And what I did was very, very stressful, um, sorting out people's uh, bank accounts who had problems with their payments and mm. their credit cards and things. So I, I used to puzzle solve people's mm-hmm. banking problems. So he'd gone to have a look to see what it was that I did. And he said to me, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to say that you are unemployable for the foreseeable future um, Mm. because I know that if I let you go back to work within a week, you will be so ill and you'll probably never get back to where you are now. Ah. Well, I'm a workaholic, so that was (laughs) devastating news because I was hoping and praying that I would improve and be able to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So after the amazing results that I'd had with LDM, what did I want to do? And I I had to think long and hard, do I get on with my life and say I'm okay? Mm -hmm. Or do I help those people that were in that deep, dark place that I was in? You know, not right. saying that LDN is a miracle drug or a cure and that it's going to work for everyone, but it is something that you could try. Yeah. You know, that isn't harmful or toxic. And, you know, the worst thing that can happen is it does nothing for you. Right. And, and there's so many people who don't know about it. Exactly. So you wanted to tell the world what you yeah. had found. Yeah. So, so you started this LDN Research Trust. What, yeah. what? How do you start something like that? And and if you would please, what does the LDN Research Trust do? And you know, okay. what resources do you have available? Yeah. That sort of thing. So, what was I going to do to try and help other people? And I'd had some meetings with the MS Society, who were unhelpful. Suspicious. Oh. Oh, no, should we say? Um, okay. And they got me to speak to their neurologist who was on board with them, who said that the only way that I could ever be taken seriously is if we became a registered charity. Mm. Now, it costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> it took five months. Five months of constantly emailing, phoning, chasing, they didn't want us to become a charity. They said research couldn't be a charity. So I said, mm. well, what about cancer research? But cancer is a condition, not a drug. So we went round and round and round and round. Okay. And eventually, I think they were hoping that I would think it was too problematic and too <laughs> wearing, tiring that I would stop. But yeah. the more I was told no, the more I was going to do it. So. Uh, we got the registered charity status mm-hmm. and um, the, we were primarily going to initially raise money for clinical trials of an MS mm-hmm. um, clinical study, mm-hmm. being gold standard double blind placebo control trial. Mm-hmm. Now that costs thousands, hundreds mm-hmm. of thousands problem we had hardly anybody knew what ldn hardly mm-hmm. anybody was taking it right people weren't prescribing it so as we know clinical trials are mainly drug company driven and mm-hmm. and now trex only is out of pattern what were we going to do how were we going to achieve that goal so while i was still investigating that the number of people who were contacting me daily asking I've heard about LDN, how do I get a prescription? Mm. So I was then realising we needed to take a step back. Mm -hmm. First of all, we needed more doctors and prescribers to know about LDN, to be confident with LDN, to get on board to do the trials and the studies. (laughs) Sure. So I think I was one of like 400 people that were taking LDN in the UK at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are thousands now and Mm -hmm. I mean, hundreds of thousands around the world who Mm -hmm. who are taking LDN. Mainly it started off for MS Mm -hmm. and then Crohn's disease and then it went on to 
you know, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid conditions, psoriasis, alopecia, eczema, asthma, uh, the list goes on and on. Wow. And there are over 240 autoimmune conditions that LDN could potentially help. Wow. Now, if a condition has an autoimmune component, it's certainly worth trying. Mm -hmm. It could work. Uh, we organize conferences which are live streamed around the world. That was a must for me because mm -hmm. wherever you have it in the world, wherever you have the conference, you're always going to have somebody say, I can't get there. Sure. So, okay, so let's bring it to everybody's home. Everybody yeah. who has, you know, a laptop, a phone, tablet, whatever, as long as you've got fast internet, you can take part. Um, and not only can you watch it as it happens live, soon as that live presentation is finished it's immediately available online as a recording so yes. if you are in a different time zone you can get up and watch them whenever mm -hmm. suits you mm -hmm. uh, you can also submit questions for the q a panels and everything's available for 12 months so wow. it gives you time to watch the presentations and if there are certain ones that um were of particular interest you can go back and watch them again and mm -hmm. again and again okay. so that was one thing we've been doing we have uh, I have interviewed I think we said 800 people now not all of them are alive uh, we have, have uh, our own radio station yeah we've that's had amazing. the LDM book uh, we have fact sheets on the website, you can find prescribers, you can find pharmacists. Um, we have a, a free LDN app, which tracks everything, you know, uh, mood, sleep, diet, exercise, other medications. You can set, uh, you can set alarms. It is amazing. Um, you, once you've printed these graphs and charts, you can take it to your doctor. And it's very handy that you can see that I mean, some people with fibromyalgia have 14 different medications when they start, and sure. you can see the graft over time. Some of them just take LDN. Some might wow. take three other medications. Mm -hmm. But that's really good. Yeah. We've developed it further. So with your permission and your doctors, there's a way of combining your – not combining, but allowing the medical professional – be it your doctor or a pharmacist, to monitor you using the LDN app as a tool mm -hmm. so they, they can see um, what's happening with you because you can do it daily if you really want to or weekly. Mm -hmm. And then they can, some in some cases, they would phone the patient and say, I can see, you know, you're not doing so good. Now you've put up your, your dose. Mm -hmm. you know, it'd probably be better if you drop back to a lower dose. Mm. That's great. Simply because they're, they're tracking them. So sure. we've done quite a few different things. Yeah, it sounds like it. All from this little lady who, <laughs> the little lady who could. <laughs> That's you. That's amazing. Hey, what? So if you wouldn't mind, what was LDN originally for? Was it um, for o opioid addiction? Is that correct? Yes, uh, alcoholics. They used it back in the... 1970s, and it was used in 50 milligram tablets three times a day. Okay. And when it was um, in clinical trials at that point, it was found only to be harmful to the liver in doses of 300 milligrams a day. Mm. Now, LDN, when I started, it was three milligrams per month. And then you increased it to 4.5. Now, the fallout rate was quite high hmm. because some people were never going to get to three milligrams. Three milligrams was going to be too high. Wow. So now mainly people start on um, 1.5 milligrams and titrate it up slowly, say every two weeks by 0 0.5 until hmm. they find the dose that suits them. Now, if people have spasticity, which mm -hmm. MS can have, yes. that's still too high. So starting at 0.5, titrating it up is good. And people with 
um, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, they're usually ultra sensitive to any drug. So a, a very mm. slow introduction is a, is a good idea. And so what happens uh, when you said that uh, for the original intended usage in the 70s, it was like 50 milligrams three times a day. That's 150 milligrams a day. So what the heck? How, how is this three milligrams? What, you said there's kind of this washout rate. What, what, what happens to people? Why, why aren't they sticking with it? That seems very low. No, no. no. I said they used to before people start on a lower dose. Mm-hmm. The dropout rate was higher when it was right. three milligrams because it was too yeah. high for people. And what so would happen to them at, at three milligrams? <clears throat> they, they, they just didn't feel well. They might have oh. had worsening of pre-existing symptoms and just generally didn't feel well. Oh, but the, okay. the dropout rate is very, very minuscule now with building it up very gradually and slowly oh. and, and dropping back if you don't feel, you know, mm-hmm. as good. So it's... It's not a case of like paracetamol take two, four times a day. Mm-hmm. It's very individualized. Okay. And some people do have disturbed sleep or vivid dreams and uh, the prescriber will say to them, in that case, take it in the morning and they find that they don't have those problems. Oh, I see. And it's just as effective. Mm-hmm. I personally have tried before I've – told anybody to do anything well I don't tell people what to do but before I've said I've tried it I've tried liquid LDN I've tried sublingual I haven't tried um, transdermal to be honest Mm -hmm. Um, and I've tried taking it in the morning I've tried taking it at night so I can say from my experience for all the different variations and different things that people have done I haven't noticed any different my MS Mm. is stable Mm -hmm. okay so why um, why don't doctors want to prescribe this? Why is this? I, I shared a story with you earlier, which was that I had early on in my diagnosis, I had heard of LDN and it was such an onslaught of overwhelming information when I started, when I got this diagnosis that somewhere along the lines, I just kind of lost track of the LDN information. But I did speak to my neurologist and, and, um, and she said, no. Absolutely not. I'm not giving you a script for that. Why is that? Why is this pushback? What the heck's the problem? Well, I would have to say with the conference, the number of prescribers has increased amazingly. It, it, is it just a lack of knowledge, just ignorance? It's a lack, a lack of knowledge and a lack of time. Mm. Um, doctors like to open a book and yeah. there it says, you know, LDN should be taken like this 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 and this and they know that's how it should be taken because it's been in clinical trials Mm -hmm. but because ldn is out of patent or the the naltrexone is no drug company will do a a full clinical trial so it's got to be trialed a different way yes just to to be clear um that is because when it's out of patent. There is no money to be made. Exactly. <laughs> Just to so, be clear for anybody yeah. who doesn't understand that, the yeah, dynamics sorry. of the drug companies. Yeah. So when a, a new drug comes out and a drug company has put it through clinical trials and paid all their staff and company cars and expenses, it's cost them a fortune to get this drug or any drug through clinical trials. So they're allowed to have a patent on that drug for, I can't remember how many years it is. I think it's seven. It's seven. I thought it was seven. Mm-hmm. Let's say seven, seven years. So in that seven years, nobody can copy it. So it's like having the copyright to it, you know? A monopoly. So, yeah. yeah, you've got it. You can okay. charge an extortionate amount of money because you need to recap, recoup rather, yes. all that money that you've spent. And when it expires, it means anybody can make it as a generic drug. Fair game. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. it's open to anybody. And LDN is, depending where you get it from, roughly in America, $30 um, for a month supply, a dollar um, a capsule. Wow. That's very different from what we normally are paying for our DMTs. Exactly. I think mine's sixty-five thousand a month. Mm-hmm. A lot of money. Isn't that insane? 
Oh. But we have learned a lot about LDN over the years. And when I first started taking it, it was you can't take it with steroids. Well, mm. Dr. Jill Smith did a study on Crohn's and she gave the Crohn's patient steroids absolutely fine. Mm. So that was OK. We'll mm -hmm. change that then. You can't take it with immune suppressant drugs. Oh, in actual fact, yes, you can. So that was thrown out of the Got window. It. So, and the only thing you can't take alongside of LDN, as far as I know, and I'm not a medical professional, is you can't have opioids and LDN in your system at the same time because they both work on the same receptors. Mm. But there are interesting really exciting things that are happening where you can take a very ultra low dose naltrexone like 0 0.001 alongside of an opioid now this has to be done under medical supervision mm -hmm. nobody can do this themselves so i'm mm -hmm. just putting that <laughs> disclaimer sure. out there um that it makes the opioids far more effective and mm -hmm. by making it effective means that the patient can take less Nice. And then as they increase the LDN, they decrease the opioid more. And we are going to be doing a documentary, which I forgot to say, we've already done three documentaries that are live, two that are in editing. And we're going to do another one on LD ultra low dose naltrexone and the opioid crisis. So oh. that's going to be really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> really wow. Exciting. Way to bury the lead. Yeah, we'll be looking for that for sure. Um, are there, I think you referenced this earlier, but are there potential side effects? By increasing it, starting low and slow and increasing it very slowly. I mean, we used to have 5% of side effects and it's just like 1% now because mm. people just don't have them. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> not saying there are no side effects. I mean, sure. some people do have side effects. Mm -hmm. Some people can't take LTN, but that is very rare. Mm -hmm. But there are people that can't take certain foods or other medications. Nothing suits everybody. Right, right. Um, so, you know, the, the hot topic right now in MS is, is CBD. And boy, I am hearing such great things about CBD. I, in fact, I've never heard any anything bad. I've only heard of good things. Um, can LDN be taken with CBD? Yes, it can. And it works very well synergistically, meaning they work mm. together. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Angus Dalglish, she wrote with Dr. Wei Lu and the team a paper on LDN and cancer, and they have done studies um, where it's shown to be very beneficial to take both together. If, for example, LDN worked 75% to help your symptoms, because obviously when you've got MS, you can have sort of one of 30 symptoms and not right. everybody has the same 30. So you can't really say what works for you is going to work for this person and that person. That's for sure. We've all got different um, symptoms. But it has been shown that if LDN hasn't helped with all your symptoms and you still think you're doing marvellously, mm -hmm. but if you put CBD into the mix, you could potentially increase that 75% to 90 or whatever. You know, wow. it's it's really, really worth taking. Yeah. It really is worth taking. How about... Um, but um, I have to say, if you don't mind me... Yeah, no, in, please. Be very careful. I mean, with LDN, you know, don't buy it over the internet. Get it from a reputable compounding pharmacy. Mm -hmm. You need to know what it is you're having. You know, when you buy something from the internet, especially a prescription-only drug, it can be anything because it means sure. it's bypassed any checks, control, quality control. You don't know what you're buying. Right. The same yes. can be said for CBD. Now, you need a pure CBD that is pharmaceutical grade. And the pharmaceutical grade have 0 0.003 at the most, I think it is, of the, um, <clears throat> I've forgotten what it's called now, HCT. THC. THC. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, in it. 
Uh-huh. So you you want to make sure that that is as low as possible and that you have a very good, a high quality grade mm-hmm. CV. To buy something that is cheap off the internet, if it looks too good to be true, it right. probably is. Right. You know, um, quality um, is paramount. And there are so mm-hmm. many people that are doing pharmaceutical grades, you know, but just check that out. Be careful yeah. because whatever you're putting inside you, you want it to be of good quality. Absolutely. Now, you um, at the LDN Research Trust, you maintain a listing of docs all over the world that will prescribe this. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. That's fantastic. And okay. we're having new doctors contact us all the time. And even after, how long have we been going? 14 years, be 15 in February, mm. um, people still haven't heard of us. Yeah. We have a, a new medical advisor, and we know that doctors are so busy, and some of them don't have the time to read all the literature, all the clinical trials. You can go on our website, there's mm-hmm. loads of trials and studies that have been done on LDN. Excellent. He's putting together a bible for doctors on certain conditions like this is all the information you need if you want to prescribe it for ms this is what you need for cancer this is what Mm. you need for uh, thyroid problems and he gives talks and lectures wow and that really helps yeah Um, doctors you know it's a manual you can look it up and he will then say if you need any help or advice or support here's my number and I you know call me I will help you so Mm -hmm. the doctors feel confident in prescribing knowing that there's a pharmacist that's done all the research right who's confident who's experienced and there to give help and advice so by working with pharmacists who in turn can educate the doctors and Mm -hmm. the prescribers because it's not just a doctor it can be a nurse practitioner or um, mm-hmm. PAC, PA. mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there are many different um, prescribers we have over here now. Pharmacy prescribers. So mm-hmm. if it's a prescriber and the pharmacist can work with them, I mean, it's just amazing. Mm-hmm. How about um, the uh, DMTs, the um, disease modifying therapies, and LDN? Yeah, have that's you... fine. Because as I say, initially. Um, they're sort of um, is this cold? <laughs> is there synergy provided between the two of them as well? Does the LDN no? It, help? But they don't. They don't work against each other. Okay. Because um, immune modulating drugs, mm-hmm. which um, immune suppressants, which are these DMDs, mm-hmm. are were thought to work against LDN, but mm-hmm. they don't. There are so many doctors that are using both together and even using methotrexate alongside of LDN. Mm-hmm. So, as I say, apart from having opioids in this, your system at the same time, as far as I'm aware, mm-hmm. you know, doctors obviously evaluate on a patient-to-patient basis, sure. but they are using both together. That's fantastic. This is all so darned interesting. And I just hate that um, it's it's um, not more widely known. So I'm so grateful for you coming for all the work that you've done, number one, and for also taking the time to come on the FUMS podcast show and share the information here. Um, If people want more information about LDN, where do they go? Okay. If they go to www.ldnresearchtrust.org you will be able to see links to um, our Facebook group that you could join we have nearly 31,000 members all over the world for different conditions many have MS so Mm -hmm. you you could ask other people their experiences and there are links to the our Vimeo channel Mixcloud where all the audio from the radio show interviews. We have um, past conferences that you can watch for free. Everything is on the website, studies, trials, prescribers, pharmacists, 
But if anybody would like to email me personally, if they have any questions they would like to ask, I'd be more than willing to do that. And my email address is linda, L-I-N-D-A, dot L-D-N-R-T at gmail.com. Excellent. And I just want to remind everybody that um, I take the notes for you. Don't worry. Don't drive off the road if you're listening to this. <laughs> I take all the notes, and this is in the show notes at fumsnow.com slash podcast, um, and just search on this podcast. All of this will be in the notes. Um, so thank you so much, Linda. This has been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate you sharing your experience and knowledge with us today. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you listening to the FUMS podcast show. Be sure to subscribe to it so you won't miss an episode. You can do that right on the website at FUMSnow.com. While you're there, sign up for the free email list so you'll be among the first to know of any new findings in MS research, new therapies and products, as well as any blog posts and podcast episodes I release. Want to chat with others in the FUMS community? Join us on Facebook at FUMS Now. Thanks again, and don't forget to talk to the stupid disease as it deserves. Tell it FUMS every day.